For the few of you in the room that don't know me, I'm Lourdes Font. I'm the acting chair of the MA program in Fashion and Textile Studies, History, Theory, and Museum Practice. And I would like to welcome you to the 2022 Fashion and Textile Studies Symposium. This annual event in which students share original research on a topic or theme that they have chosen is an important occasion in our academic calendar. It's an opportunity for alumni and family and friends to join with our faculty and students. We are especially glad that after two years of holding this event remotely, we are once again able to gather in person on the FIT campus. The symposium is the culmination of an elective course in our program titled Advanced Theory Symposium Seminar. Though our program curriculum has two concentrations or tracks, curatorial and conservation, the symposium seminar affords all students the opportunity to research, write, and deliver an academic conference paper under the expert guidance of Professor Rebecca Jumper Madison. Professor Madison is a scholar and author who is a wonderful role model for our students. Those who cannot be here today will be able to access a video recording through the FIT library where our symposium papers are archived and made available to researchers. We would like to express our thanks and appreciation to our Dean, Dr. Brooke Carlson, our program's administrative assistant, Marjorie Phillips, to Richard Hoare and his entire team at Events Management and Facilities Rental, and to James Hill for IT support, to Suzanne Baer, our videographer, and Anton Baptiste, our technologist. And now I will turn you over to Rebecca to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Lourdes. And again, welcome to everyone who's joining us either live and in person today or in the future via our recording. We are so excited to return to this in-person format for our annual symposium this year. It's wonderful to be back here in the boardroom uh, for the first in-person symposium we've had since 2019. Uh, the theme for today's symposium is function, and specifically the functions of dress. When our class began meeting at the beginning of the semester, we started by brainstorming ideas in response to several questions. What is function in fashion and dress? To what extent is fashion functional? What felt needs for performance do designers and makers try to address? Students also began thinking of ideas for possible paper topics which could consider clothing for sport, for travel, for theater, for work, or explore the social functions of fashion, such as conveying status or wealth. Performance fibers and fabrics, construction and design features, as well as the etiquette of fashion were all possibilities for papers. The concept of function and dress may initially sort of conjure ideas of utilitarianism, but dress functions in a variety of ways to meet physical, social, psychological, and cultural needs. While it can telegraph status, class, and wealth, the whimsical and unexpected aspects of fashion facilitate personal expression and create psychological comfort. Clothing may also relate to the settings in which it is worn. Forms of dress as disparate as theater costume and workwear can both function to protect the body from injury and to facilitate movement. At times, the meanings and functions of a specific type of clothing may change when it is adopted by another group. The final topics the students have chosen for today range from 19th century tea gowns and their relationship to home interiors, to the avant-garde fashions of Elsa Schiaparelli, to the fiberglass toes of contemporary Irish dance shoes. The annual research symposium of FIT's MA program in fashion and textile studies gives students an opportunity to research, write, and present a paper on primary sources. Fashion historians work with many different types of primary sources, from objects such as surviving garments and accessories, to visual sources such as paintings and photographs, to text-based sources such as historical documents. One of the great joys as a researcher is seeing and studying these primary sources in person. And while some objects and sources still remain difficult to access due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this year many students were able to study objects and archival materials in person 
um, at places such as the museum at FIT and SPARC, our special collections and college archives at FIT's Gladys Marcus Library, or through private collections. Our students utilized many other types of primary sources as well. Some students have also added to our knowledge of dress history by conducting oral history interviews. This afternoon, using primary sources such as objects, published memoirs, interviews and oral histories, magazines, newspapers, and websites, paintings, photographs, and TikTok videos, the presenters will explore how fashion and dress function in human lives. Our three speakers look forward to sharing their findings with you. Now a word on logistics. The papers will be presented consecutively in the order listed in the program. Due to an unexpected death in the family, Melinda Abercrombie will not be able to present her symposium paper today. Her paper, Literal to Social, a case study of Carhartt work in progress will be archived in special collections. After the paper presentations, we'll welcome all three speakers back up to the front for a panel Q&A. Um, during the Q&A session, we'll have a microphone for you to ask your questions into. Make sure that when we do come to Q&A, you ask your questions into the microphone so we'll be able to hear it for the recording as well. And then at the conclusion of the Q&A, we welcome you to join us for light refreshments across the hall in the living room. So now let's welcome our very first speaker. The first speaker today is going to be Maurizio Francesco Marrero, and Maurizio will be presenting a paper titled, Tea Gown's Role in the Interior as Part of a Total Work of Art. Please join me in welcoming Maurizio. In 1878, the ladies magazine, The Queen, stated, quote, a great change has come over the style of English dressing within the last, say, five years. The world of artists first started the idea of their wives and daughters dressing in harmony with their surroundings, and then the grand dames of fashion were influenced, end quote. With serving tea being a fashionable social event for centuries, by the mid-19th century, it developed new equipment, rituals, and dress. Originating from house dresses, interior gowns, or dressing gowns, the tea gown was the socially acceptable dress to wear to these gatherings. A tea gown was formal enough for a woman to receive guests in her home, but not formal enough to leave the house in. Thus, these garments were confined to one's home interior, specifically the parlor or drawing room. With multifaceted multi functions, tea gowns serve a variety of purposes, from performance to etiquette to the wearer's own personal taste. Characteristics of a tea gown can be fluid. However, robe-like one-piece dresses, no separate bodice and skirt, with a high neckline, long sleeves, front fastening, pockets, and train are most common. The resemblance to a robe was intentional, for they are to give the illusion of a robe worn over a tight-fitted dress. Often referencing Eastern culture and styles of past Western fashion, tea gowns could be designed to be in unison with the interiors in which they were worn, creating a total work of art. In instances where tea gowns were designed in the applied style of Gesamtkunstwerk, the influence of the designer or always, artist always plays a key role. In this paper, I will focus on the function of designers portraying women in tea gowns, matching their clothes to the interiors they were worn in from 1870 to 1910. Inspired by Jess Bray's argument pertaining to Henry Van der Waal tea gown in House of Fashion, Haute Couture and the Modern Interior, Barry suggests the purpose of coordinating women's dress to their interiors was to make them an art object as well as to control the total design image. I plan to build on Barry's argument by following an art historical approach of visually analyzing other artists who have utilized tea gowns and interiors to achieve Gesamtkunstwerk. However, the females discussed in this paper, the wearers of the tea gowns highlighted, are on a complex layer where they are patrons, teachers, and consumers of fashion and art but yet are objectified by the very artists they support. The concept of unifying aesthetic into one style was not new in the 1800s. However, the term coined for it was. In 1849, German composer Richard Wagner wrote an essay on Gesamtkunstwerk, or total works of art, but was not in popular use until the late 1800s. Originally referencing to theatrical, originally referencing originally referring to theatrical stage design and how all aspects of, this, of a stage show should be in unison, 
Textile and fashion designers in the late 1800s began to synchronize their work. From the 1860s to the turn of the century, William Morris, with his decorative arts and interior decorating firm, Morris & Co., to find how to achieve total works of art. As a leader of the arts and crafts movement and the aesthetic movement, Morris rejected industrial manufacturing by researching pre-industrial techniques for embroideries, tapestries, and textiles. This resulted in Morris creating his own design vocabulary inspired by Italian textiles of the 15th and 16th century. This unified design aesthetic of bold colors and patterns of pattern repeats of stylized motifs of flowers, fruits, and fauna would become his signature. Because of Morris's extensive repertoire through his design firm, one could see how he applied his style to many pieces, achieving total works of art. In addition, the dress reform, arts and crafts, and aesthetic dress movement was characterized by the rejection of tight-fitting dresses and instead opted for looser-fit garments. Inspired by the classical ideal, both dress and beauty during this time referenced antiquity and the Renaissance. Similar to this, Morris returned textile design back to the natural way of things. These social happenings would be an inexpensive way of relieving one's social indebtedness and would happen at five o'clock with guests staying between 15 to half an hour. The hostess would send her visiting card with the day and time in which she wished for the callers to arrive. Once arrived, the guests should say hello to their hostess and they are free to chat with any guests who may be present. The equipment needed would be plates, cups and saucers, cream and sugar bowls, and most importantly, a teapot and kettle for hot water. The callers would be daughters, relatives, or friends, friends, and would have been dressed, and they would have, have they would have been dressed in walking dresses or visiting toilets, with their bonnets and gloves staying on the entirety of the reception. Scene worn by both these guests in paintings by Mary Stevenson Cassett of Afternoon Tea. In the absence of a maid, if the absence of the maid is preferred, the hostess would serve the tea herself, and guests would assist in passing the cups around. Men are rarely in attendance at afternoon tea, but it was not forbidden, as seen by these Harper's Bazaar illustrations. Even with male callers, afternoon tea remained for the realm of women. As for the hostess, Goatee's Ladies Book has published multiple articles on the etiquette of dress for these informal events. An article from 1889 titled Household Department indicates that the lady of the house should wear a tea gown unless they are in America. It points out that Americans view tea gowns as appropriate dress for breakfast or, one in one, or in one's own room, whereas the English deem it fit for afternoon tea. Three years later, in 1892, an entire Goldie's article was dedicated to the etiquette of tea gowns. It states that the tea gown was the outgrowth of the dressing gown and combines the comfort of dressing gowns with the elegance of the afternoon reception dress. It also stresses the importance that the hostess be conscious that she is not to leave the house in, the, in a tea gown wherever home may be. Visual analysis of many tea gowns that still exist suggests tea gowns reside in two spheres, those that fit into a specific art movement and then those that do not. In 1884, aesthetic dress and design reform architect designer Edward William Godwin became a consultant for the dress department at Liberty & Co. Already established amongst aesthetics and dress reformers, Liberty's involvement in these art movements were furthered by Godwin. With designs inspired by the classical mode, medieval styles, the pre-Raphaelites, and Renaissance fashion, Liberty and Co. made aesthetic dress more accessible, specifically with tea gowns. With this increased acceptance of tea gowns in society, French couturier's willingness to design them also increased. Sensing the profit, they began to copy the aesthetic dress styles for fashionable wealthy women, who only desired to dress in the style in the comfort of their own home. The outcome being the rise, of access, the, the rise of accessibility for dress reformers to purchase and wear aesthetic dress. This meant women of the aesthetic nature could order a tea gown from Liberty & Co. or from the House of Worth with every intention of wearing it out in public. This is why some museums will label a tea gown a dress as well because it would have depended on the wearer. Dr. Anne Bissonnette's research shows tea gowns were first used to describe a dress in 18, in April 20, on April 27th 1878, issue of the Queen and the Ladies newspaper, newspaper and court chronicle. Before this, the word tea gown would not have been in use. Instead, elaborate, elaborate interior gowns or wrappers would have been advertised for tea time. The distinctions between interior gown, wrapper, and tea gown are perplexing. 
The characteristics between wrappers and tea gowns are very similar, and until the term is applied with an accompanying fashion plate, it is challenging to differentiate between the two. In 1871, Harper's Bazaar published an illustration of the front and back of two red two wrappers. The dresses are depicted in the interior with their own stylistic choices. However, what is important to note is each has a high neck, long sleeves, train, and a one piece. Seven years later, Harper's Bazaar published a sack wrapper fashion plate, described as, quote, easy, easy fitting and slightly loose, yet conforms to the outlines of the figure with all the grace of a tight princess dress, end quote. With identical sleeve length, neckline, and train to that of the wrapper from 1871, the 1878 wrapper is advertised with a sense of comfort, almost alluding to the fact that the wearer does not need to wear a corset. In addition, the woman in the illustration, the woman from, in the illustration from 1878 is holding a teacup. And while both from 1871 and 1878 are advertised as wrappers, the teacup implies to readers the dress is a tea gown. These two illustrations show the wrapper's evolution up until the point where the tea gown is first coined. In 1869, Frederick Richards Leyland commissioned artist James Abbott McNeil Whistler to paint portraits of his entire family in the aesthetic style. In 1871, Whistler began the portrait of Frederick Leyland's wife, Frances Dawson Leyland. In Symphony in Flesh, Color, and Pink, portrait of Mrs. Frances Leyland, the sitter is depicted from the back hands clasped behind her, wearing a dress in harmony with her surroundings. The dress and interior are both created by Whistler, with the environment being his Chelsea home at 2 Lindsay Row. Leyland's reddish brown hair sets the tone for the painting, with the rest of the hues used being complementary. The underlayer of the dress is white, and the outer layer is pink, giving the illusion of a war worn over a dress. Dark pink ribbon wraps around the sheer gray long sleeves of the Whistler design dress. A ruffle surrounds the high neckline of the dress with two pleats cascading down the back of the dress, ending in a train embroidered with rosettes. Whistler has designed a tea gown in the early stages of, quote, a transitional time that witnessed the metamorphosis of interior gowns into extremely elaborate, fashionable garments that became a type of gown on their own, end quote. By synchronizing the tea gown worn by Leyland with his own interior, Whistler has unified multiple elements in this painting to create a total work of art. There exist over 10 sketches of the design for the dress worn by Leyland in Symphony in Flesh and Pink, in Flesh Color and Pink. Each variation shows Leyland in a different pose, holding a variety of objects like a fan or book and in multiple dresses. The variations are mostly white gowns with rosettes scattered along the train. These sketches demonstrate Whistler's meticulous attention to, to detail and how the dress is as much a work of art as the painting itself. Out of the multiple studies, there was one sketch of white and yellow and one titled The Black Dress. The Black Dress was created to appease Leyland's teasing behavior, who saw Mrs. Lewis Huth stand for her portrait in a black velvet dress and asked Whistler to do the same for her. Teasing aside, Whistler's desire to have artistic synthesis took precedence, and the black velvet dress was not chosen for the final portrait. However, Mrs. Huth's portrait, Arrangement in Black, number two, Portrait of Mrs. Louis Huth, creates an interesting juxtaposition to Symphony in Flesh, Color, and Pink. In Mrs. Huth's portrait, she is seen in a black dress in a dark room, to the point where it is difficult to tell where the silhouette of the dress ends and the room begins. Whereas Leyland is depicted in a tea gown, which is meant to be worn in one's own home, and yet she's wearing it in someone else's. Research does not indicate a reason for Leyland to be entertaining out of Whistler's home. So what was the function of this tea gown? Was Whistler's intention to show favoritism amongst his patrons by showing one sitter in a dress he designed amongst decor he also designed? Especially when a study exists of Mrs. Huth's portrait where she's seen amongst an interior but was changed to the final version. Or perhaps he was attempting to show ownership of Leyland by completely wrapping her in his vision. Though Frederick Leyland initiated the relationship with Whistler, The two, oh, I'm so sorry. It was Whistler and Francis Leyland who would become very close. The two, Francis Leyland acted as the liaison for Whistler with his other pa patrons, further supporting be him beyond his artistic vision. Though never confirmed as lovers, letters from Whistler show there was an admiration for Francis Leyland suggesting an affair. The stylistic choices for Symphony in Flesh, Color, and Pink, with Whistler styling every aspect of Leyland from 
Her poster clothing is symbolism for women out of reach. Historian Jess Berry argues in House of Fashion, Haute Couture and the Modern Interior, that Belgian artist Henry Clams van der Waal viewed his wife, Maria Louisetti, as an extension of the interior and therefore an object in the room. In 1895, the architect and interior designer started working at his home, Blumenwerf, where he designed the interior, the entire exterior and interior. Van der Waal was inspired by the arts and crafts movement, the dress reform, as well as the pre-Raphaelites to design a total Art Nouveau interior unifying all aspects of decorum with fashion. Art Nouveau was an art style that swept Europe and consisted of abstract flowing curved forms. The gown designed by Van der Waal for his wife adhered to the styles of the dress reform by its loose fit, not requiring a corset, and banishment of most surface decoration. Meeting the requirements of multiple interior gowns, one of them being a tea gown. A German culture, cultural institution recently recreated one of the Van der Waals gowns from 1900. The original gowns, collars, cuffs, and hem are the only parts of the dress that have lasted, but the photograph from 1900 is cited as an inspiration for the replica. In the photograph, Maria van der Waals stands in the hall of Blumenwerf in front of a piano with a score by Richard Wagner. The curvilinear motifs found at the gown's collar, cuffs, and hem match the arched back of the chair next to Maria van der Waal. The scrolling motif found in the hem of Maria van der Waal's gown, almost an Art Nouveau interpretation of waves, looks similar to the wall motifs on van der Waal's cigar straw. This tea gown, the interior of Blumenwerf, the Havana Company cigar straw, and the Havana Company cigar straw demonstrate, demonstrates van der Waal's ability to achieve cohesiveness across all works. When discussing why to dress his wife in his own designs, Van der Waal remarks, quote, in decor like that of Blumenwerf, the presence of a woman dressed by some haute couture firm would have been an insult, end quote. Henry Van der Waal loathed haute couture, couturiers because he thought they were more concerned with profit over beauty. If Maria Van der Waal had chosen a fashion designer such as the House of Worth to create dresses, it would not only have gone against Van der Waal's perspective on haute couture, but also would not have been in unison to Van der Waal's design interior, not making a total work of art. Another way to interpret the quote is because of Van der Waal's authority over all creative outlets in his life, not being able to design the clothing worn in his home would have been an insult. In addition to the tea gown already shown worn by, van der Waal, by Maria Van der Waal, Henry Van der Waal also designed and manufactured tea gowns for the public. This gown worn by Maria Van der Waal was in an exhibition, was exhibited with a handful of other artists' fashion designs in 1900 at Kretfeld Museum from the 4th of April to the 13th. The swirl motifs on this dress are linked directly to the paintings and furniture behind Maria van der Waal, making her an extension of the home. Similar to the first van der Waal tea gown shown, this one also adheres to the Art Nouveau movement. With, the, with this exhibition, Henry van der Waal wanted to spread his perspective on women's fashion and how it should be homogeneous to its surroundings. In his essay about the exhibition, published in a German magazine, translated to A New Art Principle in Modern Women's Clothing, Van der Waal writes, quote, from now on, shows of, women, shows of women's clothing will take their place among art exhibitions. Undoubtedly, we begin to see clothing exhibited, sometimes next to paintings and sculpture, as recently has, has been the case with other works of applied art, end quote. Though not wrong, this quote sheds light on Van der Waal's design process and how he views clothing as an art object worthy of an art exhibition. This furthers the idea that women who wear his tea gowns take on the role of an art object. In addition, in his essay, Van der Waal expands on his opinion of haute couture and consistently refers to women as slaves to haute couturiers, cites women's passive demeanor, the reason they have lost control of the fashion industry, and expresses his main concern with women's fashion is beauty over profit. He thinks Parisian clothing firms toss women back and forth from tight-fitting then loose-fitting dresses for their own amusement and profit. He suggests women's main objective is to be beautiful and that he's helping them return to this purpose. Most secondary sources that discuss Henry van der Waal's work focus on his designs for women. However, as seen in these circa 1900 photographs of Van der Waal and his wife in the workshop at Blumenwerf, he also lived in these spaces. In the first photograph, Maria Van der Waal is wearing a floral motif aesthetic dress with large puffy sleeves. 
whereas Henry van der Velde is wearing traditional menswear. Due to the lighting of this photo, Maria van der Velde stands out, whereas Henry van der Velde's attire completely blends into the darkness of the photo. Another photograph of the Blumenwerf workshop from the same year shows the interior in better lighting with van der Velde at work and reveals a kneeling youth stat statue by Belgian artist George Mein. These photographs create interesting dialect around why Maria van der Velde had to wear gowns with Art Nouveau curvy linen motifs embroidered on them and Henry van der Velde did not. Though it is correct that van der Velde was most concerned with women's fashion, not men's fashion, these photographs pose the question of why did Henry van der Velde not make himself a part of his total works of art? The answer is van der Velde was so concerned with controlling all elements of interior, fashion, and decorative arts around him, he forgot to make himself a part of his total work of art. By fashioning Maria van der Velde in gowns to match the home, Henry van der Velde has made his wife as much of an art object as the kneeling youth in his workshop. In 1892, Gaudi's Lady's book wrote about tea gowns and stated, quote, women never look prettier or more graceful, more ornaments to their surroundings than when they wear, than when they wear this tasteful and comfortable creation, end quote. This quote from Gaudi's implies the function of tea gowns is not only for surface appearance, but also to serve the purpose of an accessory to its atmosphere. Unlike the 1878 quote from the ladies' magazine, The Queen, at the start of this paper, Gaudi's does not state women have to match their interiors to be ornamental to the room they are in. Under this scope, we can examine tea gowns under a new light. The splendor of this voided velvet aesthetic tea gown by Jean Philippe Worth for the House of Worth worn by either Helen Olivia Bryce or Margaret Catherine Bryce could have done just that. Most certainly, either of the Bryce sisters would have christened any room they entered in in the grandeur of the 693 Fifth Avenue home in New York or the Kekilian House in DC. Completely wrapped in this aesthetic dress with a historical influence, the Bryce sisters matched the level of luxury of either of their homes. The Bryces resided in the Kekilian House from 1893 to 1897 and the, home interior, the home, home's interior images, date of 1890 to 1910, meant they were taken while the Bryces lived there or previous or past tenants. However, we can use them to examine the scale the tea gown would have been worn in. Dr. William de Gregorio attributes the possible inspiration for this Worth tea gown to this 1860 painting of Jane Morris by Sir Edward Coley Byrne Jones. In this watercolor, Jane Morris is depicted as Sidonia von Bork from William Menhold's Gothic romance, Sidonia the Sorceress. The dress has interlacing circular, interlacing circular motifs resembling a rub worn over a white dress. However, the dress Jane Morris is wearing in the 1860 Sidonia painting, as well as the circa 1893 tea gown by Worth, have similarities to the dress worn by Maria van der Velde at the Blumenwerf workshop in circa 1900. The most notable similarity between the three dresses are the size and sleeves and overall silhouette. Whether van der Velde was aware of this Worth tea gown is unknown. However, him designing a similar dress to the haute couture he despised so much is ironic. In all of his writings, one thought van der Velde lacks to mention is that haute couture has to be beautiful for it to sell. And though it is indeed driven by profit, there is no lack of beauty in fashion. By using tea gowns as the final puzzle piece in a total work of art, the artists discussed in this paper have fashioned women into art objects. Though the initial intention was to not objectify women, it happened to be a result of Whistler and Van der Velde achieving Gesamtkunstwerk. Whistler indirectly de depicted Frances Leyland as an accessory to his own interior, treating her as part of the entire ensemble. Van der Velde originally wanted to reform women's fashion by directing women away from consumer trends set by haute couture. Instead, his ideals on beauty and by modern standards, his sexist opinions on women's involvement in fashion makes his motivations questionable. His tea gowns are a lens to see his controlling and dictatorial behavior towards design. Even when not designed to be in harmony with its surroundings, women's, women dressed in tea gowns could still be treated as, uh, as ornaments. Bound to the rooms of one's home, in one way or another, tea gowns are treated as decorations in a parlor room. Whether it is used to show the artist's relationship with the sitter in a portrait, or to exercise one's design principles, or to control the total design image, the tea gown has an unexpected function in total works of art.
Thank you. All right. So our next speaker will be Karen R. Perlman. And the title of Karen's paper is Whimsy and Fancy, Spectacles of Surrealism and Scaparelli's Fashions. Welcome, Karen. The inner war years of the 20th century were an era of experimentation and interdisciplinary dialogue between fashion, textile design, applied arts, literature, and music. One fashion designer, Elsa Scapulari, arose from obscurity to fame by transporting the pragmatic functional purpose of clothing to the realm of embellished fantasy. Elsa's intense need to create, adorn, and embellish was the function that manifested in her clothing and accessories that served the body. The desire for the whimsy and fancy was the guiding force to harmonize decoration and function in dress. Scaparelli's proclivity to transform the ordinary utilitarian clothing into the spectacular was rooted in her formative years. Scaparelli's interior life, or psyche, was the wellspring for her ceaseless creativity, innovation, and pioneering use of materials. The aim of this paper is a preliminary exploration into some of the psychological underpinnings of Scapulary's hunger to lavishly embellish dress over the commonly sold focus on the surface appeal of her original fashions. The research assumes a historical and object-based approach to gain an understanding into the psychological motivations of this complex and progressive woman. The historical research for primary sources will include excerpts from Scaparelli's autobiography, archival photographs, object viewings, and images from museum holdings. The foundation for Scaparelli's creative life was formed during her childhood. Elsa's Italian lineage was a prominent aristocratic family that cultivated enriching experiences of travel and education. This highly stimulating environment nurtured the young Elsa's imagination and creativity, which would be indispensable to her later as a fashion designer. Yet, Elsa's developing self-esteem was marred by an insecurity about her physical appearance. Multiple family members compared her looks to her older sister, Beatrice, whose beauty was unmistakable. Elsa suffered the repeated destructive words of her mother, who told her, quote, she was as ugly as her sister was beautiful, unquote. Elsa recounted how her godmother, called Beatrice Palais Athena, or a Greek beauty, that left an indelible impression. In her autobiography, Scaparelli recounts how as a seven-year-old, she desperately tried to beautify herself by planting flower seeds deep in her throat, her nostrils, and her ears in order to become a blossoming garden like no one else in the world. Elsa's childhood wounds carry deep, ingrained feelings of unattractiveness into adulthood, where she struggled with depression. Scapulari, as an adult, compensated by enveloping herself in lavish decorative dress to feel like a garden as she attempted as a child. This means of coping is understandable since decoration is one of the primary purposes of clothing along with protection and modesty. The psychologist and psychoanalyst J.C. Flugel expanded on this basic purpose of decorative clothing. According to Flugel, decorative clothing is motivated by the desire to enhance one's sexual attractiveness. He also proposed that a more nuanced motivation is to increase one's sense of power by the extension of the body. Flugel relates the sense of power to the whys of fashion, namely 
the dynamic tension between sexual and social forces. The hows of fashion are the central mystery, according to Flugel. The central mystery of fashion speaks to Elsa's inner life. Therefore, one could ask, how did Scaparelli's future fashion serve her body, and by extension, other women? In 1913, Elsa, a 22-year-old young woman, desired to immerse herself in the center of everything that was avant-garde. Paris was a magnet for artistic movements that spurred a cultural revolution in the arts and fashion. The vanguard of Parisian fashion designers would adorn the early 20th century woman in innovative dress, including Scaparelli. She gravitated towards elements of surrealism in dress designed during the most controversial years between both world wars. Also, other notable designers embellished dress with startling surrealistic imagery. For example, Marcel Rochas created the bird dress, composed of a seagull enveloping the neckline and bodice that exuded an ethereal elegance and grace. This dramatic image was effectively captured by the photographer Harry Mearson. This surrealistic dialogue enhanced the unique and unexpected fashions to another dimension of imagination. A turning point happened one synchronistic evening in Paris when the surrealistic photographer Man Ray escorted Scaparelli to Le Boussure sur le Toit bar. The bar's ambience of an iridescent glass ceiling and Raoul Dufy lithographs invited Scaparelli into the world of the avant-garde. One patron of the bar was Jean Couteau, who would later become influential in designing surrealistic imagery for Scap Scaparelli's fashions. Another seminal event happened one day in Paris, where Scaparelli curiously observed a friend's knitted sweater. The sweater was textured in multiple layers and elastic without losing shape. Scaparelli's inquisitiveness led her to meet the knitter, an elderly Armenian woman who would later knit the famous Trompleau bow sweater and other sweaters of geometric patterns that defined the modernist aesthetic. These unusual knitted sweaters, a type of functional sportswear, propelled Scaparelli's career as a fashion designer. This achievement early in Scaparelli's career would further develop her working with a team of embroiderers, jewelers, designers, and artists to create her surrealistic visions. In particular, Christian Bernard, Jean Couteau, and Salvador Dali were the most important collaborators in expressing Scaparelli's exclusive fashions. The art movement of surrealism was primarily literature and the visual arts, but Scaparelli offered three-dimensional objects, fashionable dress. Scaparelli's in entree into the world of surrealism was a natural complement to her artistic sensibilities of originality and eccentricity. Like the surrealistic painters, Scaparelli drew upon principles of displacement and illusion to produce unconventional and playful couture and accessories. Scap Scaparelli considered accessories as a very important medium of communication for her fertile imagination. Leopard fur um, was favored by Scaparelli, especially accessories such as shoes and hats. Scaparelli was her own model and muse where she wore short leopard fur boots to a bowling alley. This social context would have been considered eccentric for standards of dress in the 1930s. Monkey fur was fashionable in the mid to late 1930s for the adventurous woman. Madame Jean Paquin used monkey fur as an embellishment for a feminine and youthful evening dress. However, Scaparelli was more daring in her use of monkey fur, where she intentionally exaggerated 
the primal grotesqueness that was truly shocking for the time. In 1938, Scaparelli collaborated with the famed shoemaker Andre Perugia in designing the monkey fur boots. The inspiration for the monkey fur boots was Magritte's painting, Disarmed. She reintroduced monkey fur in a later collection for the spring 1948 featuring a sweater dress where the front and the back were covered with a cascade of monkey fur. Did women love these primal tactile embellishments that could be experienced as ugly, grotesque, shocking, sexual, or strangely beautiful all at once? In this realm of embodied fantasy, Scaparelli was a seminal designer who defined the unique and fashionable woman. The qualities of women who gravitated towards Scaparelli's fashions were independence and confidence to express herself in a whimsical and fanciful attire while evoking femininity and manifesting practicality. To express her exhilaration for the dramatic, Scaparelli introduced theatrical performances in themed fashion shows as early as 1935 at her Place Vendôme Salon. The collections emphasized embellishments to spectacular proportions that communicated her own inner life as an ever-changing and evolving garden of beauty and whimsy. American Harper's Bazaar decided to cover the debut of the salon in the summer of 1935 by hiring the painter Raoul Dufy rather than a photographer. Dufy's affinity for fashion and theater enabled him to render a colorful and luminous depiction in his Fauvis style that conveyed the atmosphere of the salon. The completed painting was featured in the October 1936 issue of Harper's Bazaar. The ambiance of magic imbued the decoration in the salon with inventive displays. For example, Scaparelli showcased perfumes by hanging in a life-size birdcage. Shoppers were drawn inside the birdcage by the scented perfume that was sprayed for allure and seduction. My in-person viewing of the shocking to Scaparelli perfume bottles and bath sponges were a delightful surprise the hourglass perfume bottle inspired by the actress Mae West with a cluster of flowers expressed romance and sensuality. The other perfume bottle of gold-plated flowers with faux rubies was especially sweet and feminine. The bath sponges resembled cotton swab discs that were intended to explode into a washcloth when immersed in water. The unexpected and original served the body. The object of the birdcage was meaningful since Scaparelli kept a large one in her home. One can ponder if Scaparelli's choice of a birdcage reflected an aspect of herself. Interestingly, the artist Pablo Picasso painted an allegorical portrait of Scaparelli as both the white dove and a black bird inside a birdcage, which reflected her dual nature. Picasso, a close friend of Scaparelli, sensed that she experienced a measure of entrapment that was paradoxical to her free-spirited fashions. Scaparelli had a deep attachment to this symbolic painting as she expressed in her own words, quote, even though poverty-stricken, I wouldn't take a fortune for my Picasso, unquote. The sentimental attachment to this painting was familiar to Scaparelli's granddaughter, Marisa Berenson, who feels the birds represent different aspects of her grandmother. Symbolically, the blackbird is trying to free the white dove from their entrapment. Elsa's boundless creativity was freeing to her inner divisions. The zenith of Scaparelli's creativity was characterized by thematic collections between 1938 in 1939 at her salon at Place Vendôme. 
these collections exemplified how extensive embellishments for dress superseded mere utilitarianism. Also, Scaparelli understood how embellishments and accessories can elevate an ensemble to the spectacular. She preferred designing an ensemble emphasizing accessories rather than a sole dress. Scaparelli designed and delighted in creating belts, gloves, hats, purses with subversive, surrealistic effects such as plastic hands to evoke a sense of disbelief from her clients. The circus collection was designed for the summer of 1938. In her autobiography, Scaparelli has described the circus collection as, quote, the most riotous and swaggering collection, unquote. She described the circus characters getting loose in a mad dance up and down the staircase and swinging out of the window. This collection was characterized by playful prints, embroidery, and buttons. One pink silk twill jacket featured a repeated design of blue circus horses that were embellished with cast metal buttons of acrobats. These playful buttons functioned as a focal point of interest. The photograph shows a model wearing the acrobatic jacket with a striking hat and necklace. The bodily pose in this ensemble signifies the assertive woman who exudes confidence, wit, and humor. Women's Wear Daily credited Scaparelli for starting the circus consciousness in fashion, where circus-themed prints and accessories were sold in American department stores. In contrast to the circus collection, the Pagan collection premiered for the fall of 1938. This romantic collection was inspired by mythological subjects and the world of nature. Scaparelli's intention was to heighten the senses in the wearer and viewer of these pagan floral appliques and insects inhabiting dress. The result was the creation of startling beauty and intrigue, like the imagined garden of her childhood, which became part of her core central mystery. She wanted women to look like they emerged out of a Botticelli painting. The long purple gown was inspired by Botticelli's painting, Primavera, that featured a collar wreath made of sequins, plastic leaves, and flowers along with floral clusters on the body of the dress. Scaparelli may have imagined Flora and Primavera wearing this modern fanciful dress of springtime renewal. Insects is a theme in surrealism that Scaparelli appeared to have enjoyed. The insect motif is prominently represented in a striking and somewhat grotesque design of a flat collar necklace. The base of the collar necklace was made from glass like Rodin and studded with colored metal insects. The illusionary suggestion of crawling insects on one's self was original and shocking. The success of the collection was noted in Women's Wear Daily, Daily's advertisement of Scaparelli inspired jewelry that was sold at Bonwit Teller under the label Field and Forest. Scaparelli infused accessories with a surrealistic and playful trompleo, such as the posy bag. The posy bag is a bouquet of violets and pansies that is reminiscent of the Victorian culture. The trompleo is the hiddenness of the bag that is obscured by the fluttering of the loose stitched flowers. My research included an in-person viewing of this bag at the museum at FIT. The posy bag was a sweet and fragile bouquet of velvet flowers. I imagined how much enjoyment a woman must have felt carrying this whimsical and fanciful bouquet of velvet flowers to a party or walking down a charming cobblestone street in Paris. The hidden delight of the posy bag carrying the secrets and trinkets of a 1930s woman. Perhaps Scaparelli's secret was to carry a dainty bouquet of flowers that concealed her inner childhood garden. In 1953, the artist 
Marcel Vertes made a collage of a surrealistic landscape of butterflies and dinosaurs and magazine cutouts of Schiaparelli's signature fashions as a tribute to her as a towering figure. The butterfly was one of Schiaparelli's personal symbols that also graced her fashionable dress. It is the butterfly, more than any other symbol, that signify her life as a journey of metaphorsis. She transformed her inner feelings of ugliness to a colorful, fluttering butterfly that continually evolved. Schiap Schiaparelli's life was about creating beauty through decorative dress, thereby completing her own central mystery. In her own words, she stated, quote, dress designing incidentally is not to me a profession, but an art, unquote. For Schiaparelli, the body served as the canvas to dress her artwork through embellishments, embroidery, and fine materials and design that express surprise, humor, and originality. Scaparelli drew upon her life experiences to inform her art, like other artists and designers, but she sought to beautify everything her imaginative mind conceived of. Scaparelli strived to be the most uniquely dressed woman in the world, akin to feeling like a blooming garden as she sought as a child. The need for the whimsical and fanciful is how Scaparelli expressed the central mystery of fashion that she brought to the world. The contradictions and complexities of Schiaparelli's personality enabled her to create an intermingling between dress and art that was significant in the early 20th century. One can believe that Schiaparelli's courage to be bold with a fantastical design aesthetic touched the ethereal realm which has remained so appealing and relevant in contemporary times. So our final presenter is Deirdre M. Morgan, and Deirdre's presentation is called Fancy Feet, the Function of Fiberglass and Irish Dance Hard Shoes. So let's welcome Deirdre. The Irish love dancing, and there is no pleasanter sight than a well-danced jig or reel or hornpipe, all performed with a solemnity befitting the people, for they are a more serious race than they generally have credit for. The lips keep their stern gravity, and except for an occasional whoop when the heels strike the ground and the subdued more power of the audience, the dance is conducted in silence. This quote appeared in the Magazine of Art in 1888. Irish dance as a cultural art form would not enter the world stage until 1994 with the performance of River Dance during the interval of the Eurovision Song Contest. Unbeknownst to most audiences, Irish dance had made significant changes to its aesthetics and movements in its recent past, most notably with the shoes worn for the performance. Before the 1990s, the shoes used to produce an audible tapping sound were made of stiff leather and additional nails or metal tacks. By 1991, a new shoe technology emerged with dancers wearing flexible leather shoes that had fiberglass tips and heels. By the time Riverdance premiered in 1994, the fiberglass hard shoes had surpassed the previously used leather shoes with added nails. 
In order to create as much context for the function of the fiberglass heart shoe, this paper will contain a brief history of Irish dance, ultimately focusing on the evolution of shoes worn for heavy dances, dances that specifically require the use of hard shoes. Fiberglass became an industry standard for Irish dance hard shoes by the mid-1990s, and this material has now gone unchanged for the past 30 years due to it satisfying not only the needs of dancers, but also the people making the shoes. The evolution of shoes used for Irish dance can be seen through extant images and video from the 20th century, as well as personal accounts of competitive dancers, dance teachers, and shoemakers. Conducting oral histories for this project aided in both creating a timeline for when the change in shoe materials took place and in understanding the functionality of the shoes in the realm of Irish dance. My oral history participants consisted of professional dancer and teacher Niall O'Leary, Irish dance shoemaker Pat Fay, family and friends who competed in Irish dance, and a member of the Irish Dance Commission, former dancer, and author of several publications on the history of Irish dance with a focus on the costumes, Dr. John P. Cullinan. There are several forms of Irish dance, each with their own settings, movements, and types of shoes worn. For the purposes of this paper, I will be focusing on step dancing seen in both competitions and professional performances as this style of dance primarily uses fiberglass hard shoes. The earliest known depiction of dance in Ireland has been dated to the early 17th century thanks to a bone plate in the collection of the National Museum of Ireland. This illustration of the bone plate shows five men performing what is believed to be the withy dance, which is similar to a sword dance. Brendan Brethnach, an author of several publications detailing the history of Irish music and dance, makes note that the modern style of Irish step dancing, quote, is an art form admittedly derived from the other traditional forms, but now is consciously independent of them, end quote. So while the history of dance has existed in Ireland for centuries, it was not until the 18th and 19th centuries that the form of Irish step dancing seen today emerged. The first major contributors to the modern form of Irish dance were dancing masters who began traveling around Ireland in the 18th century. Patrick Kennedy traveled around Ireland from 1810 to 1818 and wrote extensively about the dancing masters that traveled through the towns he stayed in. In his description, dancing masters would stay in a district comprising about four or five townlands for several nights with a central farmstead that would host the dancing masters classes and festivities. The emergence of the dancing masters created a new development for dance in Ireland. They taught social and set dances and began teaching solo and step dances. An illustration by H. Helmick appeared in the Magazine of Art in 1888, depicting a dancing master and two pupils. The accompanying article written by Ernest Chesnew reads, quote, the opportunity for a dance is one delightedly availed of. Mr. Helmick's dancing master appears to be initiating his pupils into the mysteries of the set, i.e. of quadrilles, which, more for fashion's sake, probably than anything else, makes an item in the program of every peasant dance, end quote. In this illustration, the clothing the dancers are wearing is clearly depicted. The woman has no shoes, or at the very least is not wearing them to dance. And the woman depicted sitting on the bench behind the dancers is also not wearing shoes. The shoes of the male dancer and the da dancing master are very similar in shape. At this time, there were no specialized dancing shoes, and the clothing worn during dance competitions would not become regulated until later in the 20th century. And, quote, up to the beginning of the 20th century, a good pair of leather shoes was a precious luxury, end quote. It was not uncommon at this time for women in Ireland to be barefoot, even if they owned stockings and shoes. These items would typically be reserved for special occasions like Sunday mass or fairs and markets. While there are a few descriptions of what was worn while dancing, either at small gatherings or performances during festivals, there are a few from Patrick Kennedy's travels. He mentions one shoe in particular, the turn pump, in two instances. One being a group of boys performing a dance known as the Ring of Father, which, had been a, which was a type of long dance that had been in Ireland for at least a century. Kennedy writes, quote, we had the delight of seeing 12 young men come forth, accompanied by the same number of young women. The boys danced much more showily than the girls. They wore in their shirt sleeves, waistcoats, knee breeches, white stockings, and turn pumps, end quote. In another portion of his writing, Kennedy describes what one dancing master had worn on an evening of teaching dances. Quote, Mr. Tench sported a tight knee breeches, white stockings, turn pumps, and a swallowtail coat, end quote. 
Term pumps have been a particularly tricky shoe to identify. In a conversation I had with author and previous dancer, Dr. John P. Colonon, he gave me more insight into these shoes. His understanding was that these shoes were worn by the gentry and also dance masters who were in a middle to high social class. The shoe would be made of a light, flexible leather with a slip-on design rather than having to lace them up. The softness of the leather would indicate how expensive the shoes were as they were not meant for hard labor. These shoes from the Victoria and Albert Museum are a close match to the description Cullinan provides. The shape of the raised heel, a soft leather top of the shoe with soft leather soles, makes for an interesting comparison to the shape of regulated Irish dance shoes from 1970 and 2005, respectively. It is possible that the term, term turn pump came from the turn shoe technique, where a flexible leather upper and sole would be stitched together, then turned right side out so the seam was left on the inside of the shoe. By 1894, the Gaelic revival movement and the push to create an Irish identity after centuries under British occupation led to the creation of Conra na Gaelga, the Gaelic League. Initially created as a way to revive and teach the Irish language, the Gaelic League developed into a commission that revived and regulated all forms of Irish arts and culture. The Gaelic revival movement saw the solidification of the modern form of step dancing, renaming it to Irish dance at the end of the 19th century. The creation of the Gaelic League eventually led to separate commissions for sports, dance, and music. The League promoted the expression of Irish culture by sponsoring competitions, leading to a need for definitive cultural expressions in a way that could be adjudicated. Competitions amongst dancers can be traced back to the early emergence of the dance masters and have been documented in informal settings. An interview conducted for Dr. Frank Hall's research reads, quote, as far back as memories, records, and legends go, there have been competitions of one sort or another between dancing masters, their pupils, or simply people with clever feet, end quote. The most common place for competitions in dance and music were festivals called a fesh. Quote, the Gaelic word for fesh, plural, feshana, means cultural festival or gathering. It is used within the Irish dance community to denote a formal competition meeting, end quote. The Commission of Irish Dance on Comishuin Larinka Gaelica was founded in 1930 to create regulations for dancing, especially in competition. In his book, Dr. Frank Hall writes, quote, in establishing an institutional practice of Irish dancing as competition, on Comishuin was following a model that had been developed throughout Britain in the Victorian era, the model of modern sport. This included codification of rules and a hierarchical structure of competitions based on local, county, provincial, and national levels, end quote. The commission not only regulated dances and techniques for adjudication, but also regulated costumes, hair, makeup, and shoes. The development of a regulated Irish dance hard shoe can be tied to the formation of the Gaelic League and the Commission of Irish Dance. In the time of the early dancing masters, while there were no specialized dancing shoes, the movements that would be associated with hard shoe dances began to emerge. Initially meant for boys and men, there were steps described as grinding. They were, quote, performed by striking the floor with the toes of each foot alternately in time to the six notes in the bar, end quote, where shuffling was a step performed by girls, quote, by giving each foot alternately a light shuffling motion in front of the other, end quote. By 1914, in the second edition of the Handbook of Irish Dances, there is a reference to a modernization in dance where women were dancing steps initially taught to men. At this time, primarily starting in County Cork, women were executing the same hard shoe steps as men, a practice that would have, as the handbook states, quote, been a source of the utmost pain to witness a girl treble or batter or perform other manly steps, end quote. This video of TikTok user Costello Irish Dance depicts the movement of a treble or a batter. The step consists of three sounds and is used throughout all hard shoe dances. Today, men and women perform hard shoe dances and use the same types of shoes. An image survives of a young dancer named Cassie McNeil who was photographed during a dance competition at the Feshna Glen, the Glen's Fesh, held in County Antrim in 1904. She is wearing a white long sleeve dress, stockings, and boots with a slight heel. 
Her hair is down and her hands are placed on her hips, a posture that is not too rigid, but keeps the upper body still. Although it is unclear whether Cassie McNeil was competing in a soft shoe or hard shoe dance, this photograph still serves as an example for what women would have worn on their feet during competition. Comparing Cassie McNeil's clothing to that worn by Mona Kinsella and Evelyn O'Connor in the 1930s, the overall dance costume and shoes has been regulated. Kinsella and O'Connor wear knee-length white dresses, jackets, black stockings, and brogue-like shoes with a buckle and what appears to be an ankle strap. Because of the Irish Dance Commission's regulations, it allowed for the development of a shoe specifically worn for Irish step dancing. The first shoe designed to become regulated for dance competitions was a lace-up leather shoe with nails on the bottom. Although these shoes were used for Irish dancing, they were typically a light walking out shoe or good dress shoe that a cobbler would add a built up tip and heel to, then attach small nails or tacks. This shoe developed from a work boot men wore throughout Ireland called the hobnail boot. These types of boots had, quote, very thick soles that are almost completely covered with hobnails and stout heels protected by an almost horseshoe shaped iron tip, end quote. The nails themselves were referred to as boot protectors because they advanced the life of the work boots, protecting them from the ground. In his book, Aspects of the History of Irish Dancing in Ireland, England, New Zealand, North America, and Australia, Dr. John P. Cullinan recounts interviews with a man named Cormac O'Keefe who learned to dance at the Cork Pipers Club, the CPC, in the 1890s. Cullinan recounts, quote, Many of the dancers that Cormac met at the CPC were occasional or regular visitors, and most of them were travelers. But for all the encumbrances of twine and hobnailed boots, they could dance in those days." End quote. In the poem titled On an Island, John M. Singh also mentions men dancing in nailed boots. Quote, and now we'll dance to jigs and reels, nailed boots chasing girls' naked heels. End quote. By the 1950s, the leather being used to make shoes was becoming thinner, and the stages used for dancing were changing. The idea of a hobnail boot was adapted for the dancing shoes to produce a more rhythmic sound. A pair of shoes worn by John Morgan can, exists from the 1970s. The upper, the part of the shoe that goes over the top of the foot and laces, and the sole, the bottom of the shoe, are made of stiff leather with added tips and heels of built-up leather. Nails have been added to the tips and the heels to provide added sound when the shoe strikes the floor. These shoes were widely accepted as Irish dancing shoes throughout the late 20th century until the advent of fiberglass tips and heels. By the 1980s and 1990s, Irish dance was undergoing small incremental changes, first in the costumes worn, then in the techniques choreographed and performed, and finally, the introduction of the fiberglass hard shoe. In my interview with Irish dance shoemaker Pat Fay, he recalled that in 1991, his father created the fiberglass tips and heels in Ireland. Along with adding fiberglass tips and heels, Fay's shoes also changed the sole of the shoe to be made with suede instead of stiff leather, giving more flexibility through the arch of the foot. A pair of shoes made by Fay's from 2005 serves as an example of this. These shoes have fiberglass tips and heels, a soft leather upper, and a white suede sole. The tips and heels are also covered in duct tape added by the dancer to provide friction against slippery floors. When developing the fiberglass material in the 90s, Pat Fay said his father tested several different types of materials. Quote, we tried injecting a hard plastic, which wasn't the same sound. We tried different things, but over time, we figured out that the fiberglass was the best way to go and it was keeping the better sound." End quote. With the trials of new materials for hard shoes underway, the one material that was never under consideration was the steel tap, like those seen on tap shoes. In my interviews with both Niall O'Leary and Dr. John P. Cullinan, they noted that rulings against steel taps on Irish dancing shoes had been in place since, the, since early in the dancing, Irish Dancing Commission's founding. Harkening back to the ideas of Irish nationalism instilled by the Gaelic League, Irish dancing shoes needed to remain within an Irish tradition. And the sound produced by the metal taps was a thinner, lighter sound than many dancers liked. Today, it is not uncommon to see professional dancers adding steel taps to their shoes, 
But in a competition setting, which is how most professional dancers learn how to dance, the only metal permitted on a hard shoe is the nails or screws that attach the heel to the shoe. This video, taken in the phase workshop in Dublin, shows how the uppers and the soles are put together through molding and stitching. The fiberglass heel is added by screwing it into place and it is then sanded into shape before the tip is finally added. The material used for the hard shoe tips and heels is a composite referred to as fiberglass. It is an epoxy resin that is mixed with a solution that hardens after the resin has been molded to the desired shape. A composite is, quote, a material made from two or more different materials that when combined are stronger than those individual materials by themselves, end quote. The fiberglass fiber, quote, provides strength and stiffness, and the resin provides shape and protects the fiber, end quote. An epoxy resin allows the reinforcing fibers in the composite to have stress transferred between them, a feature that works well for a material taking on vibration and strain. According to the American Composites Manufacturers Association, the benefits of composites are that they are strong, lightweight, have corrosion resistance, give the maker flexibility with design, and are durable. Irish dance hard shoes need to aid the dancer in producing a sound, the tips and heels need to be shaped and molded to a desired look, and the material needs to be strong enough to withstand the force of the shoes hitting the floor and themselves. Although there is a uniform look to Irish dance shoes, Niall O'Leary <laughs> noted in our interview, quote, every shoe manufacturer apparently has their own secret formula, but they don't share, end quote. A composite material created an ideal transformation for Irish dance shoes because it remained lightweight while still producing a clear sound and aided in the developing movements in Irish dance. According to Fay, the desired sound is a, quote, thin, crisp sound, end quote, which is produced both from the shoes against the floor and from the shoes against themselves. Prior to the development of fiberglass shoes, the movements for Irish for hard shoe dances were close to the floor, as seen in this video of Nolene Jackson dancing at a fesh in New York in the 1970s. Her movements are closer to the floor in contrast to movements seen today that utilize the use of the entire shoe and the length of the performance stage. In 1983, Brendan Brethnock described that movements in Irish dance had begun to change, saying, quote, in movement, the dance is propulsive and elevated in striking contrast to the vertical floor tapping of the traditional dancer, end quote. In contrast, this video of Morgan Bullock, taken in 2020, shows the modernization of the dance form. The movements in this combination are still close to the floor, but the emphasis of this dance is placed on not only creating rhythm through the amount of force behind the steps, but through the complex movements that utilize all areas of the fiberglass tips and heels. The shoes themselves provided dancers with the ability to execute movement, and as the shoes developed, so did the movements. The ability to produce multiple heel clicks and execute toe stands are two notable changes in Irish dance movement that emerged at the time the fiberglass shoes became available. This video of Kate McDaniels highlights the movement of toe stands. <laughs> This movement can be executed several ways, producing sound, allowing the dancer to travel, or elevating the dancer's stature before a new movement. By 1996, with the premiere of Riverdance at the Point Theatre in Dublin, Ireland, fiberglass hard shoes had solidified themselves as the emerging shoe for Irish dance. It took several years for shoemakers to perfect their composite formulas. Niall O'Leary recalled the early shoes chipping and even one brand having heels shatter entirely during performance. They also produce a crisper sound than the previous nail shoes were able to and in a way that has less effect on the body as less force needs to be applied to the movement. The development of the fiberglass material has also created a healthier work environment for the shoemakers. They no longer work with tough leather, nails, and sanding machines that were previously needed. Although there is room in the current Irish Dancing Commission's rules for future technological developments, the fiberglass hard shoes are not going out of fashion anytime soon. 
A special thanks to several people who generously donated their time, knowledge, and personal history to this project. My grandmother, Mary Morgan, my parents, John and Jeanette Morgan, Patty and Kevin Furlong, Pat Fay, Nyla Leary, and Dr. John P. Cullinan. Now we'll have a time for questions and answers. We'll just let, give a moment for the panelists to take their places. All right, so questions. I think I see Lourdes's hand first up. So Lourdes, we'll let you open us up. Hi, thank you all to all three of you. Thank you very much. Um, I noticed that something that uh, was in common among all of your papers is close attention to materials and the importance of materials. And I did have a question for Karen, if you can tell us more about the materials that were used for that insect motif necklace. I think you said that it was glass-like rhodion. Did I hear that correctly? Um, uh, yeah, the insect necklace um, that was part of the Pagan Collection, 1938. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So right, it's that clear type of glass. Uh, but what is rhodion? So gla uh, glass-like rhodion, it's not actual glass. Right, it's a type of acetate. Um, Some kind well, of... Well, you know. Plastic? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I guess I maybe reviewed my conservation notes from a couple years ago. <laughs> so there was a lot I had to focus on. And, and the Met but, identified... But the it was... Um, Take the mask off. Oh. Um, it was basically used as a substitute for glass, and in the 30s, um, I'm sure many people know, there were different plastics that were used. Um, it was very common, and um, from Bakelite to celluloid, probably like five or six different type of plastics, different compositions, and... Um, it was part of costume jewelry, and so the insects were uh, kind of a cast metal type of uh -huh. colored, and so I think Skepper really effectively captured this uh, crawling of insects on one's neck, which was, uh, you know, pretty startling. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? All right. I see you in the back. Well, I'll make my way back there in a minute. This one is for Maurizio. I just loved your subject, and I'm, uh, I've long had an interest in the connection between interiors, dress, and artworks. And um, I'm super. I hope you're going to write a thesis on it because I'm like re I really want to read it. And the and the other thing, uh, I had a just quick question: if you've come across many William Morris textiles in like aesthetic dress, because you know in my travels I really haven't seen that many. But my colleague here, Marjorie, tells me there's one in the FIT Museum. I was just curious if you came across it. In your I have not come across a lot of William Morris uh, textiles made into dress. Are we referencing the uh, Maria Van der Waal dress with the puffy sleeves? Uh, actually, I was thinking of William Morris textiles for some reason. Yeah, yeah but I was at... I don't know why. It was just like a little curious. I haven't come across. Um, I came across the Maria Van der Waal one who we, I think is William Morris, but there wasn't enough to attribute to him, or it's the William Cow. but I have not seen the one at the MFIT. And I have another question. Okay. The Corcoran House, is that Bryce with a B or Price with a P? Bryce. B. With, yeah, with a, a B. Boy. He was a okay. senator. Um, I think he lived in New York. His, her father was a senator. He lived in New York, but he was like a senator for Ohio. It was like really controversial over like why he was a senator for like a Midwestern state. <laughs> Thank you, it was really wonderful. Yes. Hi, this is also for Mauricio. Sorry that you don't get a break. It's okay. <laughs> um, so I thought in your paper, it was just really interesting talking about the subject of like the gendered issues and the sexism that goes into designing women as part of the furniture in a room and the idea of the male designer not including himself in that. So on that note, I was just curious if like during your research, if you went ahead and 
looked at some like men's dressing gowns? And if you did, if just you noticed any similarities or differences that stood out to you? I did not look at any men's dressing gowns. What I looked off was Gustav Klimp because he wore a lot of tunics that matched his lovers. Um, Amelia, F I don't remember how to say her last name. Food, yes, thank you. Uh, and that's why I looked at because I thought that there were like contemporaries or people that Henry Van Der Velde did look up to that were dressing similar to uh, the women in their lives. So that's kind of where I looked at. But dressing gowns was a good idea and I definitely should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Other questions? This question's for Deirdre. <laughs> I was really interested to hear that the early iterations of the fiberglass material in the shoes was cracking and was essentially sounded kind of unreliable in the beginning and problematic. I was just wondering what about that material was so special to the wearer uh, and I guess to the maker that allowed it to continue to get manufactured and to eventually wind up being like the primary material? Was it extra comfortable? Was it more affordable? I'm just wondering how the development of that material overcame the challenges it seems to be experiencing in its early production. Yeah, um, so I don't, this is like me surmising my own thoughts. I don't have an Um, so this is my surmised answer. I think at this point, um, by the time the fiberglass was sort of becoming used pretty frequently, um, a lot of the shoemakers, or the one shoemaker that I spoke to was really adamant that they didn't want to be using nails anymore because it was a very dangerous work environment for them. And then once they started using fiberglass, I think people really enjoyed the sound that it was creating. and when I spoke to Pat Fay, he was saying that they tried a bunch of different materials that maybe wouldn't have cracked, but the sound wasn't right. So I think they were just willing to keep trying out the formula to see what would stick. Um, and I know the, the one maker whose shoes shattered um, on stage, they're not really making shoes anymore. There was like a, <laughs> there was like a big boom of them in one of my interviews. Um, with Niall O'Leary, he was saying that this particular brand had like a bunch of sponsors, people were talking about them a lot at feshes and at competitions, you know, getting people to um, buy their shoes, but they were known as like a one and done. You would do your competition, your heels would shatter, and then you would do the award ceremony in a different pair of shoes because your shoes were broken. Um, and he asked one of the dancers that he knew who was um, a sponsor for them, and she was like, oh, I do not sponsor his hard shoes. I sponsor his soft shoes. Um, so people knew that their shoes weren't working, and I particularly don't, have never come across anybody that used that brand. Um, so I think Faze and then Rutherford's shoes, and there are a couple brands in Ireland that really just kept going and figured out their formulas pretty quickly, that once everybody was switching over to them, they were no longer chipping like that. Thank you, and I have a question um, for all of our panelists. I was wondering if, if each of you could just share a little bit with us about what drew you to your research topic originally. As we're starting to think about function, what was it that made you interested in the topic you ended up choosing? Um, okay. Well, uh, in my uh, former uh, professional life as a uh, clinical psychologist, ma marriage family therapist, um, I'm just naturally inclined to be interested in um, the psyche, the background of the designers. Um, and because, uh, you know, usually, you know, we just talk about the object and there's so much to talk about the object in terms of construction materials, embellishment, et cetera. Um, but I'm also interested in the person and their journey and what drew them to become a fashion designer and also the type of fashion. And so with this particular topic, um, I, uh, you know, art's been a big part of my life. So I've always been interested in, in surrealism and then Scaparelli uh, was um, 
I wanted to learn more about her. And for me, she stood out, um, not only because she incorporated surrealistic elements that you know we all know, but just the extensiveness of her embellishments and her um, attention to detail, I mean, was just like no other. It kind of like, you know, Balenciaga said uh, that she was the only true artist in couture. Um, so, you know, she just, she just went for me just to another level. And so when I was uh, reading, um, you know, there's a lot about her childhood, like for all of us, that's significant, has a bearing on adulthood. Um, but, you know, especially uh, this desperate attempt of planting flower seeds in her throat, nostrils, you know, in ears, um, that was just partly a metaphor going off and then connecting that to Flugel's theory and um, it's just one small um, little kind of aspect of a of her kaleidoscope in terms of her personality there's so many factors so um, you know part of the reason why I came to this program is that I also want to um, you know I, I want to inject a uh, kind of more of a psychological understanding to, you know, subjects in fashion that I think is kind of lacking, you know, because it's been mostly sociological, anthropological. So. Great, thank you. Next. Uh, I came to my concept actually from an object I was assigned uh, advanced conservation back in my conservation days. Uh, and. It was a tea gown from around 1880s, and as I was researching it, I came across Anne Bessonette, who was kind of a very authoritative voice on tea gowns. And I, she made this really great, she, it was a sentence I was able to back up with my own primary sources about how the parlor room was able to rise and the dining room kind of fell out of fashion a little bit because it was cheaper to entertain uh, in the parlor room than it was to give a full dinner service. And from that, it kind of led to looking into uh, interiors and tea gowns, because I really thought about the function of a tea gown after it leaves this room, and does it still have a function after it, when it's not in the parlor room? I also wanted to look at how fashion would treat women and how it can kind of be both things where these women were supportive and artistic individuals themselves, but yet were objectified by the men they loved and by the art styles they also loved. Thank you. And Deirdre. Let me try this. Is it working? Is my working now? It's mostly for the video. Um, okay, so I thought of this topic in our interior, um, historic interiors class. Um, our professor was giving a lecture and there was one slide on fiberglass in fabrics and she sort of asked us, does anybody have any um, examples that they personally know of and have seen of fiberglass used? And my brain is just like Rolodex saying like, oh, have I? Um, and I was like, oh, I actually think that Irish dance shoes had fiberglass in them. And we were brainstorming our topics for this class at the exact same time. And I hadn't landed on a topic yet. I was really struggling and trying to figure something out. And then I was like, oh, I wonder if this would actually work. And so I started doing a little bit of research to see if anybody had written on the shoes. And there was very little out there. Um, a lot of what has been written is just the history of dance. And um, there's like a sentence or a paragraph about shoes. Um, so I thought that this was a really great opportunity to expand on that and give um, this material and part of this historic cultural, um, what am I trying to say? Cultural history, um, a place in academia. Great, thank you. And I think uh, there's definitely a great theme of how different courses all relate to each other and the importance of that synthesis between the different classes that you're taking. So it's really great to, the way, to see the way one comes to bear on another. So that's pretty exciting too. Um, other audience questions? All right. Hi, my question is also for Deirdre. <laughs> um, I mean, you touched on it lightly, um, but the the competition dresses. Mm -hmm. When when did they sort of? I, mean, I know the girl from the '80s looked more like what 
the girls wear now. When, yeah. when did that switch happen? So the costumes have definitely undergone the most change. Um, there was this um, dress at, in the mid, like in the 1920s that women would wear that was kind of like established by the Gaelic League as like Irish dress. So that's what people would wear for competitions. And then by the time the Irish Dancing Commission came around, each school started making their own dress, which is, I believe, what Nolene was probably wearing. Um, and those would have specific symbols and colors depending on the school. And then sometime around the end of the 1970s and into the 80s, um, girls started deciding, you know, I want to wear my own dress. I want to have my own solo dress for my solo competitions. And from there, they've just sort of escalated. Um, it's definitely an interesting thing to look at an Irish dancing costume from the 1980s and then look at one from today because they are very short, they're very bejeweled, um, the symbols on them don't really have any Celtic um, identity to them. They sort of do, but a lot of the ones that were used in the like 60s and 70s specifically came from the Book of Kells. Um, so it's, I don't know what prompted people to do it. I think it was just wanting to make your own stamp on it because I, Irish dance was very regulated as like, this is a cultural form, this is a national art form, it has to be a certain way. And I think it got to a point where people were like, I wanna make my own artistic stance on this. Um, so it was somewhere in the, the 80s and 90s that people started branching out. Great, other questions? I'll make it quick. This is for you, Deirdre. I was just really curious in looking at the images and um, how the, the women were unshod, mm -hmm. at least to a certain point. I, I was curious if there was sort of a, you know, I understand it as sort of like almost a country dance. And mm -hmm. so I, I was like, oh, but, but it really struck me how the men were wearing shoes and, and, the, and the women weren't. Um, yeah, yeah. I came across one um, paper in a journal article that really detailed women wearing shoes in Ireland and it had they had done a survey um, where they had taken from like church bulletins and all this stuff people quoting women's use of shoes and for a lot of them they either didn't own them and didn't wear them they would have a sort of stocking or some slipper to put on in the winter time when it was cold um, but leather was a luxury and for a very long time Ireland was just a very poor country and it's a lot of rural area so um, the men working out in the fields would have their shoes because they would need to protect their feet but the women that were at home or maybe just working around the garden would have whatever they would need for that, but it wasn't necessarily a leather shoe. And then when it came to dancing, they wouldn't have their shoes on for dancing. Um, and even if they were going to like a market or fair, they would walk with their stockings and their shoes in their hand barefoot. They've kind of come to this like congregating place where everybody would put on their shoes at the same time, um, at like a ceremony of sorts. And then they'd walk into the fairgrounds and you know, um, have their shoes on for that particular moment. So it was definitely, I haven't traced like when women started wearing shoes all the time or even had their own pairs of shoes, but it definitely comes down to the luxury of having shoes and be, being able to afford them. Thank you. Thank you. I see Lourdes has her hand up here in the front. Can I just ask you to talk a little bit about this exhibition that we have on the table here, some of these objects? Yeah, Karen, do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Well, um, I got a couple things for the event from eBay. So um, these are the bath sponges. Uh, this is the type of thing that I viewed at Spark. I think theirs is a little smaller. It wasn't on the slide, couldn't fit everything in it. But um, So uh, it has the S. And this is like from around, it's from the 30s. I think this is one of the original um, packaging. So there's still a slight scent. It's pleasant. And um, so as I mentioned in the talk, when you put in water, it just kind of explodes or becomes like a wash cloth. And so that was the element of surprise. She delighted in surprising people and, um, you know, fun and playful. Not, not your typical. I never um, heard of that before. And then um, it's not so easy to get the original um, perfume bottle. I know the reflection couldn't quite see it, but 
Uh, the original bottle was um, the shape of a uh, Mae West, the actress, her bodice with flowers. Um, but anyways, um, so like on eBay um, or Etsy, you can find some different sets from Paris. Um, this is vintage. I think it's more like 50s, Art de Triomphe. So it has, uh, and a lot of the bottles aren't always full. These are pretty full. So it has her shocking perfume and has Balenciaga. It has a few others. And um, she made a total of uh, six perfumes. And um, I think it was Jean Clement. Um, you know, she had different artists, you know, one person that made her perfume bottles and, you know, one was a candlestick. But anyways, they were always kind of original and inventive and unique and that was her style. So, and this is my, one of my little, little kind of doily things <laughs> I collect. <laughs> um, and then I have the two pairs of shoes from my home uh, that were in my presentation. These are my dad's when he danced in the 70s. So they're soft leather, they lace up. Um, they're just like a dress shoe. Um, and then the cobbler added a leather tip and a leather heel to it. And there, you can see like there's all these built up um, additions to it and then they nailed the small nails into the heel and the tip. And then this is my shoe um, that I wore when I very briefly danced. Um, and so this uh, is from FaZe. Uh, that was the only brand that my dance uh, school bought from. Um, and it's a soft leather. Uh, I think these were one of the first um, Sort of, they have like a flexi sole. They like change the names of it every time they re sort of formulate what they're doing. Um, and so I went with the white leather. You could also do, or white suede. You could also do black suede. And then there's the fiberglass tip and heel. And then because we were dancing at a lot of like halls and libraries and we never really knew what the floor was going to be like, we always added duct tape um, because it could get really slippery. Thank you all. And I have one, one more question because part of what we do in this class is really, really emphasizing time research research and that always brings up some kinds of challenge. So there's always something that you have to really work through. So my question for each of our speakers today is what was your biggest challenge in your primary source research and how did you overcome it? There's always more than one way to do something. So let's these great solutions. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges I faced was I didn't realize conversations around tea gowns could be so complex about gender. And before I like blatantly wanted to say that like Henry Von Develle had some sexist opinions, I wanted to see how women during that time also felt. Uh, and I read an article on um, Bloomsbury. I forgot the name of it, but. We talked about a lecture that uh, Von der Velde gave in Vienna, and he referred to Vienna women as mindless hordes, keen on following consumer trends, that also offended a lot of women in Vienna. So I kind of took from that to be like, it's kind of okay to say that he was a little sexist, especially by modern standards, <laughs> but also by 1900 standards as well. So that is kind of what I did to lead me. Thank you. Um, for me, I think getting the initial research stage underway, because I had my own thoughts and opinions and knowledge based on my interactions with Irish dancing, um, but I really didn't know anything about the times, uh, the timeline of the change. I didn't know anything before 1970, um, and I kind of found out that what I did know was more sort of myth than actual fact. Um, so definitely finding reputable sources um, and getting interviews in as quickly as possible was the best way for me to sort of get under my feet. And then once I started conducting the interviews and finding more and more sources, everything slowly started opening up for me. Well, um, I, I think the biggest uh, challenge that took 
the most time um, is to was to find a primary source in dating um, her collections. There were well, there were six huge collections in a series between 1938 and 39, um, and there are reputable uh, secondary sources such as Blum who wrote the exhibition book for the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But, um, so I was trying to verify uh, months and dates. Um, so it's, it's hard to find that in primary sources. When I looked at Vogue and Women's Wear Daily and um, other things, I, I just wasn't getting always the month and the date that I saw in secondary sources. Um, one thing that um, I, I guess uh, saved the day for the circus collection um, is that a Women's Wear Daily article did reference that um, you know the collection was made in February for the summer, so that was okay. Uh, for the pagan, um, you know. The jewelry came out in the summer. Uh, there was there was just advertisements, but I didn't find anything in Elsa Schiaparelli's autobiography. She, you know, when she talked about the collections, she didn't give dates or anything. Um, so, you know, I've learned from this class that uh, even some very reliable or well-known sources, like even the Met or Blum just may not be enough, um, but it's, it's been an uh, important part of developing one's scholarship and, you know, try to strive for a high quality um, paper. Um, one thing, this wasn't primary, but her granddaughter um, has a book entitled Private Album, which had a lot of photographs and things that's not printed elsewhere and that kind of filled in just cer certain things. But it's, it almost seems like there's, um, it's just more limited. It just seems like there's a lot more secondary sources than primary in relating to her collections. Great, well thank you all. Let's give all of our speakers another round of applause. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, if you would like to join us now across the hall, we will have some light refreshments over there. I'm sure the speakers would be happy to chat with you more. If you have other questions that you are too shy to bring out in front of the group, we'd love for you to come talk to them, ask them more about it. They've done so much great research. I'm sure they'd love to share more about what they've been finding. Thank you all so much for coming today. And um, we'll come chat more. One last thing, if you didn't pick up a speaker bio sheet,